overcome the world. And Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 through 58 made sure that the Corinthian Christians understood that, that to overcome, part of that was, was to overcome death. There are a lot of people in, in life who fear death. But that should be one thing that Christians never fear. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 essentially that because Jesus overcame death, we can overcome death through Him. And so first this morning, heaven is for those who overcome. Secondly, I want you to know this morning that heaven is for those who are saved. Look at Revelation 21 verse 24. This is part of what Wayne read for us this morning. Verse 24 says, And the nations of those who are what? Saved, the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. He's speaking about this new Jerusalem, this new city, a heavenly and a holy city that is pictured to be heaven. And he says that it is the nations of those who are saved who will walk in the light of the glorious Lamb of the Son of God. And if I've understood my Bible correctly, that means that all saved of all times, of all places, will be in that heavenly Jerusalem. Now, if that's the case today, you might want to know how you can be saved. I don't know about you, but that would be of utmost importance. If, if, if I must be saved to go to heaven, what does it mean to be saved and how do I be saved? How do I go from lost to being saved? Here. We often say that a person must hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized in order to be saved. Well, I want you to know that that is true. The Bible says in Romans 10 and verse 17 that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And once you've heard that word, there is something that you must believe. And, and the believing part is that you must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 8 and verse 24, the Bible says, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. Jesus Christ left the glory and the splendor of heaven and came to this earth. And, and he's, His message was to everyone everywhere that He was the bread of life, that He was the Son of God, that He was divine, that He was the Savior of the world. And if you don't believe that this morning, there's no way you could be saved. The Bible also teaches that you must repent of your sins. That is, to turn away from wickedness and turn toward... Verse 3 says, Unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Perish with those who are wicked and evil. And then a confession of our faith must be made according to Matthew 10 and verse 33 where the Bible says, If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. And most people in the whole wide world don't have a problem with those four steps in what we've come to call the plan of salvation. And yet that would not be enough to save someone. Because your Bible still says in Mark 16 and verse 16, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And your Bible still says in Acts 2.38 that when the people on the day of Pentecost said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what must we do? Peter still stood up to them and said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And folks, that is God's plan to save man. Does it involve water? Absolutely. Did I put it there? Absolutely not. God did. So follow the puzzle, people. Jesus said, if you want to be saved, you've got to believe and be baptized. 
Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Revelation 21.24 says that the saved will go to heaven. You know what that tells me? That a person who's not been baptized for the remission of sins cannot go to heaven. That's somewhat harsh, you might think, and, and you might say that's unloving, but, but that's the Bible truth. I, I just want to tell you the truth today. And the Bible emphasizes it so much so that the Bible says, in, in, that Peter said in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, the like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. In other words, not taking a bath, not cleansing the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now that's the initial way that you are saved. But if you want to stay saved, which sometimes is a challenge, you've got to be faithful and you've got to overcome. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to mess up. You're going to continue to sin. But when you do, John says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through chapter 2 and verse 2, that if you'll confess your sins and repent of your sins, the blood of Christ will cleanse your sins and you can continue that saved state. See, heaven is a place for those who overcome, but it's a place for those who are saved. Number three this morning, heaven is a place for those who are pure. Heaven is a place for those who are pure. Look at Revelation 21 and verse 7. Or 27 rather. Revelation 21 verse 27. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Did you catch that, folks? Nothing that defiles, nothing that is unholy, nothing that is impure, nothing that causes an abomination, nothing that causes a lie, none of those things will enter into that heavenly city. That means that no sin will be there. And so if you have sin in your life, if you are serving sin, if you are serving Satan, either as a Christian or a non-Christian, you can't go there because heaven is a place for those who are pure. That's because God is so holy and so just that a person who serves sin and serves Satan violates his holiness and justice that he cannot, even if he so wanted, he could not allow that person to go to heaven. Now that shows me the importance, folks, of making sure that we confess, of our, confess our sins and repent of our sins when we do sin. Uh, and it doesn't matter what it is, uh, whether it be a lie or whether it be gossip or drunkenness or adultery, it doesn't matter what it is. And I've often said I would hate to make it to the gates of glory for God to look at me in the eye and say, this one thing is all that kept you out of heaven. But he is so holy and so perfect and so completely just that that is a very real possibility. And that's why he gave us his son as a perfect sacrifice in order to appease his wrath. To make sure that mankind had a hope and a way to go to heaven. That's why Isaiah said in Isaiah 1 and verse 18, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Now I could list for you a, a multitude of verses in the New Testament about purity. Verses like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, where Paul lists a, 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 a multitude of ungodly and unholy characteristics. And he looks at the Corinthians and he says, Such were some of you, but now you are washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what Paul was saying? They were impure, but had purified themselves through the blood of Christ. I could read to you the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, where Paul lists those unrighteous and wicked characteristics that men sometimes make a part of their life. And then he says that these, those who practice those things do not inherit the kingdom of God. I could read to you a similar list from Revelation 21 and verse number 8. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, 
And all liars will have their part in the lake of fire which burns with fire and brimstone. Folks, God wants you and He wants me to be pure. And the only way that happens is to contact the precious blood of Christ through baptism. Now that's Romans 6, 1 to 6. That we are buried with Him in baptism through death like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Have you been made pure this morning by the precious blood of Christ? Heaven is a place for those who overcome. It's a place for those who are pure. It's a place for those who are saved. But I want you to see in the fourth place this morning that heaven is a place for those who are obedient. Now, if you've been in the Lord's church for any number of years, any a length of time, hardly at all, you'll know that we emphasize obedience. Not because we're so good or not because we can be perfect, not because we can keep all of God's commands, but because obedience matters to God. Matter of fact, God has always required obedience in every dispensation of time, every age of time. Notice Revelation 22 verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. See, the contrast is that if you will be obedient, you can go through the gates into the city, the new Jerusalem, that's heaven. But if you're not willing to be an obedient servant, you've got to live outside. And that's where the dogs, sorcerers, liars, murderers, adulterers, and all the wicked people are. And so Jesus' message through John to these first century Christians is, you need to make sure that you are obedient. And if we are obedient, we'll stay pure because we'll stay away from those things which make us impure. You know, the Bible has so much to say about obedience. I am mystified to know that there are people today who teach and insist that obedience is not important. The Bible says in Matthew 7, Jesus says in Matthew 7, beginning of verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and in your name done one, many wonders? And then I will declare to them, Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Folks, let me say something. I don't think that Jesus is necessarily talking about unbelievers here. I think he's talking about religious people. I think he's talking about even his followers who say they're doing all of these good things for Jesus, but they don't obey him. Jesus says, if you want to enter into heaven, you, you, you want to inherit the kingdom of heaven, you've got to obey. You've got to do the will of the Father. James 1, verses 21 and 22, the Bible says, Therefore lay apart all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. We see here in verse 21, purity, and then we see here in verse 2, obedience. Heaven is for those who obey. So much so that the Bible says in Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9 about Jesus the Christ himself. Though he were a son. In other words, he was God's son. He was, he, he was uh, top notch. He was perfect. He, he's the best of the best. And, but even though he were a son, yet he still learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all those who obey him. So the question this morning is, have you obeyed God? I think about Noah. You know, Noah was obedient to God, and in a real way, Noah's obedience saved him. 
Not because he was so good, but because he did his best to, to listen to what God said and to do it. God looks at Noah and he says, it's going to come a flood. And if you want to survive, you're going to build me a boat. You're going to build me this ark. And this is how I want you to build it. This is what I want you to build it out of. And Noah obeyed God. Happened to be gopher wood that God chose. And I don't know what the area was like, but if it was anything like around here, there's a lot more pine trees here than there are gopher trees, right? And we use pine to build things, don't we? And, and what if Noah would have, would have looked at God and said, well, God, look at all these pine trees. Can't I just use a pine tree? Or better yet, maybe he didn't even ask God, just went ahead and substituted it. It wouldn't have cut it. Because Noah would not have obeyed God. If he decided to change the measurements that God gave him, no, he wouldn't have been saved. He had to obey God to be saved. Not perfect, but to obey him. I think about Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus, he did what he was told and, and thus he was saved. You remember the story how he was persecuting Christians and, and one day on that road to Damascus, he has an encounter with Jesus himself and he loses his sight and, and, and in the course of these things, God had, had told the man Ananias, he says, you're going to go down to, to this place and you're going to find a man named Saul and you're going to tell him what he needs to do to be saved. And Ananias did that. And, and the Apostle Paul recalls that occasion in Acts 22 and verse 16 and he says, Ananias told me, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And you know what? That's what Saul did. That's what he did. And, but if he, like some people in the religious world, said, I don't need to be baptized, he wouldn't have been saved because he wouldn't have obeyed. And I know, again, that you want to go to heaven this morning. Is it obedience that's stopping you? Folks, I can hardly imagine with my finite mind how beautiful heaven will be described in a way in which we can understand like a street of gold, gates made of pearl, foundations made of these different precious stones to us where there's no death or crying, no disease, where God himself is the light of this place. And though we can't fully comprehend these things, I know enough to know that I want to be there rather than in the place described as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth rather than that place described as eternal torment rather than the place described as a place with flames which burn eternally but it's important for us to understand that to get there you've got to follow the right directions heaven is a place for those who overcome it's a place for those who are saved it's a place for those who are pure and it's a place for those who are obedient. Have you prepared yourself to go to that place? Are you overcoming? Are you pure? Are you saved? And are you obedient this morning? No matter what your situation, whether you've never obeyed the gospel or perhaps as a child of God, you find yourself not doing those things or not being these things. My plea is that you would respond to the invitation this morning. That you would repent of any sin that's separating you from God. That we could pray for you, that God would forgive you. Or maybe that you would even obey the gospel this day. That you can go to that heavenly city. That you can be with God and with the saints who have gone on from, for all time in all places. So you want to go to heaven? Why not come respond right now as we stand and sing? On behalf of the Longville Road Church of Christ, I want to thank you for joining us today for our worship. If you ever have an opportunity, we invite you to join us at our physical location at 1301 Lawnville Road in Kingston, Tennessee. We hope you will come experience the simplicity of New Testament Christianity, learn about God, and become a part of His family. If you have questions, if you would like to know more about the Bible, or if you would like a home Bible study, feel free to contact us by calling 
0444. Or for more information, visit our website, www.lawnvilleroadcoc.org. Again, we thank you and we hope you have a blessed day.